Bibles to the very small, probably three-page book of Haggai. Um, if you need to look at the front to figure out where that is, no shame. Um, it's a very small one to find. It's after Zephaniah. That probably doesn't, or Zechariah, Malachi, that, you know, it's hard. They're all like real small and all together. Um, or you can pull up your U version um, there. But while we do this, I'm going to ask a couple of words. And if you can relate to it, respond with a whoop. Okay, let's test. I'm going to say whoop. You say whoop. Whoop. Okay. Uh, how about procrastination? I think a lot of you are lying. <laughs> um, how about distraction? <laughs> okay, so I also have a tendency to lose my motivation with a few things or to lose interest. Uh, maybe you guys lose your motivation with homework um, or you procrastinate. <laughs> yes, yes. You guys procrastinate perhaps um, with... Uh, making your bed or cleaning your apartment, or maybe how about for those of you that procrastinate putting gas in your car <laughs> and you're praying on the way to the gas station as you roll in, like, please, Lord, let me make it, right? Um, I, there's a couple of times that my husband had to bail me out on the side of the road because my fumes got me within seeing the gas station, but not all the way in. But I'll tell you the one thing that I like doing the least and that I'll start doing and then... I'll stop. And then it's so frustrating because it gets completely undone by the time I get around to doing it. I have to do it all over again a second time. And it is laundry, right? So I'll wash the laundry. Usually I'll remember to dry the laundry. And if not, then I have to rewash it. Hot water, add vinegar, by the way. That gets the funk out. Um, that's the mom fact for the night. Um, so I'll have to sometimes rewash the laundry, then dry it. And then if it's towels, you got to dry it twice so it doesn't get that icky mildew smell, right? And then I'll bring it upstairs, and as long as I'm awake, my kids are asleep, fold it, right? So that way it's not all wrinkled, but let's be honest, it doesn't always get that far either. And then I'll just leave it. But heaven forbid, it's my clothes, right? Because that's the worst, because they don't even all go in the same place. Some of them hang up, and there's like four different drawers and three other other drawers that have things to go in. And that's just my clothes. It's not even my kids and my husband's, because I put clothes away for four people, okay? which is just obnoxious, because it's the thing that I hate the least, right? And so I have all my, my laundry that's like folded in the four baskets in my house, and then it just stays. And then as I'm digging for that pair of pants and those socks and that shirt, all of a sudden everything gets unfolded again. And it just becomes this mountain that I just kind of want to ignore. I have about two laundry baskets piled of a height on the love seat in my bedroom that is calling my name, and I've scheduled it for Saturday. Um, because I've procrastinated and I've put it off, right? So if any of you like doing that kind of thing, come over. I'll pay you. Done. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, going once and done. So this is this thing that I procrastinate doing until there's so much laundry, I have multiple loads, right? And then I delay folding, and so everything's wrinkled, and then I finally fold it, and then I don't put it away, so it's unfolded, and it's more work than it would have been if I just had done it to begin with. So we're going to be talking about the people of God, the Israelites, and their procrastination as well. Um, if you guys were listening to the song earlier, you probably got a tip for the sermon title, or if you have a U version, and it's called Let's Get It Started. Um, so we are in the book of Haggai, and I told you to turn there, and then I didn't. So give me one moment. Um, we're going to start with Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. I like it, the feedback. It's good. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. That sounds really exhilarating already, doesn't it? Aren't you guys so excited about all of that that we've unpacked just in this first verse? All these, <laughs> yes, all these names and these places. But I'm going to tell you, there's some really important history and context um, that I want to share with you. And we find bits and pieces of it here. See, the, the people of Israel had been taken captive by the Babylonians, right? And the Babylonians had destroyed the temple. Now, that's a key word. I'm going to talk about the temple a lot today. And so I want you to really listen for it and pay attention because that's going to be a theme throughout the whole thing tonight. And the Babylonians had taken God's people captive. Now, see, destroying the temple is significant because the temple was God's dwelling place among his people. Previously, um, when they were wandering um, in the desert, there was a tabernacle, right? It was um, sort of like a, a temple, but it was something that would move, and it was made out of animal skins and cloth and all of those things. Probably took a long time to set up and was probably real heavy to carry. 
because um, it wasn't those real convenient hiking tent poles that we have now for different things. Um, so there was the tabernacle, then Solomon builds this beautiful temple, and then the Babylonians destroy it. And this was God's dwelling place, his place where he dwelt among his people. So they were in exile for 70 years. If you guys remember the story of Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace, the lions, all of that stuff, this is around that time period, right? And this was in Babylon. But then we have a new ruler, a Persian ruler by the name of Cyrus, and he comes in and he defeats the Babylonians. So now he's the one that is holding the Israelites captive. And he tells them, he's like, you know what, I'm going to let you leave this exile and go back to your home and I'm going to let you rebuild the temple. And there's about 50,000 of them that returned to Jerusalem in 539 B.C. There's this quote that I love by um, commentator Boyce, and it says, Gone was the glory of the former kingdom and temple. Gone was the great population. All that was left was the rubble of Jerusalem, the remnant of the people, and the task of restoration. So it's a pretty daunting task that this 50,000 people came back to. And I'm sure there was some excitement to come back home, but I know how bad my yard looks after just a couple of weeks of not mowing it. I can only imagine what it looks like after this many years away from home and in captivity. So they returned, and they initially started work on the temple in 536. They built an altar. They built the foundation. And if you look in the book of Ezra, specifically chapter 3, you can see this. Um, but then they stopped. They turned their attention to other things. And that's in Ezra chapter 3 and 4. And Haggai, this, this prophet, enters the scene 16 years later. So they've been home for 16 years. And we're going to find tonight that it was 16 years of procrastination. Um, so the temple project does eventually resume in 520, and it is completed in 516. So spoiler, that's kind of where we're going and what we're going to see. So Haggai comes in, and he's telling the people after they've been home for 16 years, and it's possible that Haggai is like an older dude in his like 70s or 80s, because the way that he speaks kind of sounds like he might remember what it looked like before their exile. And the first thing that we're going to see in Haggai is that he rebukes the people for their distraction. Um, so look with me in chapter 1, and let's read verse 2. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now I want to pause for a moment, because I didn't catch this until a commentator pointed it out. But he said, usually God calls them my people, right? Like, if my people will humbly pray, if my people will repent, if my people, and he says, these people See, this is significant because these people, or your translation might say this people, they were not living like his people. They were not living like my people. So God's saying this people, these people, say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Let's look and read verses 4 through 11. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the temple of God, lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. So basically he's saying like everything that you're doing isn't fulfilling. It isn't satisfying. You're continuing to toil and to work and to do. You have these jobs. You're working the fields. You're building these fancy homes, and yet you aren't satisfied. Let's pick up in verse 7. Again, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And I told you before, if you hear something repeated, it's God's way of saying, pay special attention. He says, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, and the hills on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. God's saying, your priorities have been skewed. You guys have been distracted. You have abandoned my temple. You've, I mean, this has been 16 years. They laid the foundation, they built the altar, and then they got busy building really fancy homes for themselves. Now, it's not bad things that they were trying to do, 
These were not evil things that they were doing, but it caused them to neglect the work that God called them to. God says, consider your ways, and because of the ways that they went about, God was withholding his blessing because of their selfishness. They started with good intentions, and they stopped. Yes, it was hard work. It had been desolate for 70 years, but there was crop failure and drought. See, God wants more than good intentions. And this was interesting that came to mind when I was reading, but legitimate excuses are still excuses. Let's say that one more time. Legitimate excuses are still excuses. See, their delay was disobedience. Oftentimes, I find myself saying something similar to what they probably said. If it's so hard right now, then it can't be the right time. A little later will be better. A little longer won't matter. We're getting by. But see, at its core, the people were more focused on themselves than they were on God. A commentator by the name of Trapp said that Solomon first built a house for God and then for himself. So even King Solomon focused on the temple first and then his home last. So because of this, there was direct consequences. This was, this was a double curse. This was a drought and fruitlessness. See, with wrong priorities, nothing satisfied. And Solomon actually writes something similar to this in Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. He talks about how everything, anything apart from God is vanity. It's meaningless, and it will not satisfy. But the beauty that we see here in this is God is calling his people to rebuild the temple. He wants to bless them. He wants to take pleasure in them. And he wants to be worshipped and glorified in his temple. John MacArthur said, The rebuilding of the temple invited the return of God's presence in their midst. And I wonder how much they missed the presence of God. Or if they were so busy doing their own things that they didn't even realize that the temple was sitting in shambles. Or perhaps they saw it, but they were so overwhelmed by the project that they chose to ignore it, just like I do my laundry, but on a much larger scale. Guzik says we should turn to him and reorder our priorities before he needs to use crisis to get through to us. See, God called them to work. And I want to ask you, what pulls you away from obedience? What distracts you from the things that God calls you to do? See, oftentimes it's not bad things. It's friendships, it's family, it's school, maybe it's work or hobbies. But see, anything that we put above God is an idol. Haggai chapter 1, let's read verses 12 through 14. Um, actually, I'm just going to summarize a couple of verses because I want to read all of Haggai, but we won't. You guys can go back and read it. Um, so here, um, Haggai, again, is going to them, and he's going to the leadership, and he's also going to the people. So we mentioned Zerubbabel. We mentioned um, the high priest, and he's talking to them. But it's beautiful because usually the people of Israel continue in their disobedience, right? And then there has to be this drastic punishment or consequence. But that's not true in this case. They actually heed the warning, and they obey. Um, that's what it says in, in verse 2 and then, or verse 12. And then later it says, the people feared the Lord. See, their obedience spurred this healthy fear of the Lord. And then God later tells them, he says, I am with you. And then it says that the Lord stirred them up. So in their obedience, he stirs them up so they have this motivation to continue to do this project. But God wanted them to take action first, right? And then God stirs them up to continue to do this. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God at the end of verse 14. The fear of God prompted their obedience. But there's a second thing that we see that Haggai is telling the people. So he told them to abandon their distraction, but he also tells them to abandon their discouragement. I'm going to tell you a little story about my sister. I don't think she would mind. I need to learn to clear these stories with people first. Um, so my sister was kind of like me. She'd get overwhelmed by a project, but she's also a perfectionist. Whoop, whoop. Any of you perfectionists? Yeah, I know, there's a, I know there's a lot of you. Um, so my sister was a perfectionist, and my parents would say, go put away your clothes, right? Now, she doesn't just want to put away her clothes. She wants it to be perfect. So she takes everything out of every drawer and everything out of the closet and off of the hangers because she's going to hang them all the right direction on the same kind of hangers and color coordinate and make sure everything's organized in the drawers, right? But then she's just left with this mountain of clothes not just the few in my laundry basket, but all of her items and probably the shoes to boot, pun intended, 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, so she has all of this stuff, and she's so overwhelmed that she's in tears, like, like rage tears. And she's just so frustrated and so overwhelmed and so discouraged by the mountain of a project that's there. And so usually I'd end up going to find her because we we're supposed to hang out. And I was like, what took so long? It should have been like five, maybe 10 minutes. And it's been like 45 minutes. And she's just like blotchy faced. Nothing's been done. And literally all of the clothes are on the floor. So nice older sister that I am, I'd help her. And that was our hanging out together because then it was time to go to bed. Um, but Haggai is telling them to abandon your discouragement. See, a month after they start this project, we see what Haggai says in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Um, so Haggai speaks, and it says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Now, at first, it kind of sounds like God might be criticizing them that the temple that they're building isn't really all that nice. But see, they were discouraged because they recalled the former glory of the previous temple. And they were disappointed with the fruit of their labor. They were disappointed that the thing that they were building wasn't nearly as glorious as the, the temple that Solomon had built. They were remembering the good old days, and then they were paralyzed in their nostalgia. See, they were remembering, and then they were crippled by the comparison. I'm going to read two somewhat lengthy quotes. So if you have the U version and you want to follow along, it's there. I thought these were just so perfect for this moment because I know I am not the only one that struggles with comparison. See, I know that I'm not the only one that struggles with looking back and wishing I could go back to simpler moments and seasons or better moments and seasons. Spurgeon says, the enemy contrasts our work with that of others and with that of those who have gone before us. We are doing so little as compared with other people, therefore, let us give up. We cannot build like Solomon, therefore, let us not build at all. And nothing, nothing is worthy of God. The great works of others and even the amazing productions of Solomon all fell short of his glory. See, here's the thing. Nothing compares to God. And so when I'm comparing what I'm doing to what another person is doing, God takes equal pleasure in that because they're still so far beneath him, right? And then A.W. Tozer is one of my favorites, and I love reading his prayers because then conviction always falls heavy on me. And I abridge this prayer here. He says, Dear Lord, I refuse henceforth to compete with any of thy servants. I will not compare myself with any nor try to build up my self-esteem by noting where I may excel more in, but than one or another in thy holy work. I am but an unprofitable servant. I gladly go to the foot of the cross and own myself the least of thy people. I purpose to pray for others and to rejoice in their prosperity as if it were my own. And indeed, it is my own, if it is thine own, for what is thine is mine. And while one plants and another waters, it is thou alone that giveth the increase. See, in comparison, we're always going to lose because either we will feel defeated and less than or you're going to fall prey to pride and arrogance. Comparison is a lose-lose. But when we bring it all to God and it's all about him, see, resignation, defeat, and discouragement can kill our motivation and our faith. So I want to ask you, what is your excuse in delaying your full obedience? Let's continue on in Haggai chapter 2 and read verses 4 through 5. And then if you're in your Bibles and not the app, I'm going to read the last part of 7 and then verse 9. It says, yet now be strong. So after the people are discouraged, this is the message that God has for them. He says, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. And then down to the end of verse 7, it says, And I will fill this house with glory. In verse 9, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. See, God reminded the people that the temple was not about them, but was about him. See, it wasn't their work or their skill that made the temple glorious. It's the fact that it was the dwelling place of God. The real treasure wasn't the things they could build and put in there. 
The real treasure was God. The real beauty and benefit was that it was a place for people to come and to be with God. It was a place for God to be with his people. But see, there's another message in this book that Haggai has for his people besides to rebuild the temple, and he tells the people to rebuild their spiritual lives. So after this conversation happens, the people are motivated once again to continue building the temple. Matthew Henry says the people were now going on vigorously with the building of the temple and in hopes shortly to have it ready for their use and to be employed in the services of it. So they were looking forward to a day when the temple would be complete and they could use it for worship. They could use it to connect with God. But see, here's the problem. Earlier, the temple was incomplete, but now their worship is also incomplete. And just like with the temple being incomplete, the reason God wanted the temple built is because he wanted to be with his people. The reason that God wants their worship to be complete is because he wants his people to be with him. So three months later, and it's interesting because we have very specific amounts of time that are mentioned here, and that doesn't happen a whole lot. And that's pretty specific, too, because Haggai is saying, I know the calendar this time of year, and you don't have so much on your plate that you can't do the things that God's calling you to do. So three months later, in Haggai chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, and I'm colorblind, so I didn't see the blue in my Bible. Pardon me. Um, Apparently highlighters are a problem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Okay, this seems real weird, right? Like, what is this even about? First of all, the priests answer correctly. So they know what's supposed to be done and how it's supposed to be done in the temple. They had the knowledge. But what Haggai is telling them here is that merely going through the actions is not sufficient. Their worship was contaminated. So why is this a problem? When our worship is contaminated, it hinders being with God. So when we go into worship contaminated because our worship is polluted by the sin in our life or because we have these idols, which is sin, that we've placed over God, he isn't in the right place, or we are being disobedient and things, it's going to pollute and contaminate our worship. But see, God cares about it because he wants to be with his people. And then in Haggai chapter 2, verse 14, and then in verse 19, It says, Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with my people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer, there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward. But then it goes on, and you think that it's going to be this rebuke, but I love the promise at the very end of verse 19, and it says, From this day on, I will bless you. Again, God desires restored relationship with his people. And he says, From this day onward, I will bless you. See, they were going through the motions, their worship was incomplete, and they had missed the point. And a commentator by the name of Guzik says, tough times don't necessarily bring us closer to God. We hope that they will. They should. It's often a tool, but we have to respond to it or it's not going to be effective. See, merely living in the Holy Land and going through the motions of offering sacrifices would not make the people acceptable. Their presence in the Holy Land did not make everything they did holy. They'd miss the point. The point wasn't their comfort or their blessing or how grand the temple was. The point was about God having a relationship with his people. And I hope you know that I'm repeating myself on purpose because the purpose of the temple was for God to have relationship with his people. So there's something that I absolutely love in Scripture, and I think, um, and I'll I'll tell you about that more in just a second, but I think it kind of starts to kick off at the end of Haggai chapter 2, which kind of seems like a loose end or weird rambling, but I think it sets the stage for something better. So read with me in Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read two verses, verse 21 and 23. So again, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 23, on that day declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So why do I get so excited about that? 
See, when I, when I read this, I realize, and we talked about let's get it started, and, and there's the base level of the story, like literally let's get started building the temple, let's, let's quit delaying, let's quit being distracted. But something that's very important to do whenever you read scripture is to zoom out. Because there's a crescendo in this moment at the end of this book. And it's the kind of thing that gets me so excited that I get goosebumps and I run around trying to find somebody that I can share this with because my mind is blowing up. And Kyla was the recipient of that today. I was like, <gasps> type, type, type. And then like, I had to like, tell her because I was so excited when God helped me to see this crescendo to understand this message. See, there's a lower story when we read scripture, but because God is so awesome, there's also always a higher story. There's levels of prophecy, right? So when prophecy happens, there's the initial message, but there's also an additional message. And see, what here we're talking about is this temple. And here we're talking about Zerubbabel. And, and it's a weird question because the, the big times in the people of Israel's life was kind of past. Like the monarchy was coming to an end. So what's going to happen? Why is God saying, you are going to be a signet ring that I have chosen you? Let's read Matthew chapter 1, verse 12, 16, and 23, and you'll see why this is this beautiful crescendo. It says, and after the deportation to Babylon, does that sound familiar? Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel. Does that sound familiar? And then moving on to verse 16, it says, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Then in verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, the cool thing about Zerubbabel is he's the last one that is in the lineage of both Joseph and Mary before their genealogy splits. He is the signet ring because it's not really him, it's actually Jesus, right? And the whole point of Haggai is that this temple is supposed to be this place of us connecting with God, right? But the temple was a temporary place. It wasn't going to be there forever. It wasn't indestructible. But then it says that there is this God coming that is God with us. So God says he's going to be with us through Emmanuel, his son. So Zerubbabel, in this whole story, the lower story, is setting the stage for this higher story of Jesus. God with us us. And see, that's the message of the entire Bible on every page, Old Testament and New Testament. It's people that because of sin are separated from God and a God that loves his creation, that we bear the thumbprint of God and that he pays the price to bridge the gap, to restore relationship with us. Pays a price that wasn't his to pay because he wants to have restored relationship with his people. So when his people are wandering the desert, he says, build a tabernacle and I will be there. And there's the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, right? And then he says, build this temple and I am there with you, right? And the temple's not so glamorous. The second time around, he says, that's okay because the point isn't the temple. The point is me with you. And then through this, it pushes us all the way to the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel. And the point is that it was God incarnate with us. But it doesn't stop there. This is a pre-story about the reality of Jesus. The temple was a dwelling place for God to be with his people, but like I said, it was a temporary one. Because through him, Jesus, through the most glorious one, the eternal one, through the destruction of the temple, the new temple comes. Do you guys catch that? See, the temple was destroyed, and then a new temple comes. But then Jesus says in John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The destruction of the old temple brings the new temple, right? In Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, we read earlier, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. What did he mean? Because the one that they built wasn't going to be nearly as nice as Solomon's temple. It's because he wasn't talking about that when he was talking about Jesus. And then he says, the Lord of hosts, and in this place, I will give you peace, declares the Lord of hosts. See, the peace wasn't just for them in that day, in their not quite as chic temple that they were building. He was also talking about the peace that he was going to give us in Christ. John chapter 14, verse 26 through 27 says, and I love this about peace, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Are you hearing this echo? Because see, the Bible's telling one story. There's the lower story, but the higher story connects all throughout. And it's God's desire to be with his people. It was in the temple. It was further back in the tabernacle. It was with Jesus, and even now, it's with the Holy Spirit for a dwelling place for God to live among his people. Stopped. 
instrumentation. See, here's the thing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So it went from tabernacle to temple to Jesus, and now we are the new temple where the Holy Spirit dwells because God, Emmanuel, is with us, because God desires to be with his people. That's the theme. That's the point of the tabernacle, right? That's the point of rebuilding the tabernacle. Or with Jesus, his resurrection was because God wants to be with his people. So I have two challenges, and I'm going to address two audiences of you because you fall in one of these two categories. Either you are a follower or you're not. And for the sake of follower versus wander, I'll classify that as a wander. Either you are walking in restored relationship with God or you're in broken relationship. And you need that relationship restored. So to the follower, I would wonder if you are a discouraged one. And I want to tell you from Haggai, we can see that God tells us that we can be strong and we don't need to fear and we can have peace. And that's because his spirit dwells in us. No matter what it is that you are worried about, whether it's health of someone you care about or it's the career fair or anxiety or stress or relationships, We can be strong and we don't need to fear because we can have the peace that the Holy Spirit brings us. But to the wanderer, to those of you that do not walk in restored relationship with God, the distracted one and the delaying one, I want to ask if you've been made new, are you a restored temple or are you still lying in a state of destruction that needs to be rebuilt as a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit? You have a choice. So you can choose to remain among the rubble, delaying an invitation for God to dwell in you. But I want to tell you the time is now. God wants to build his temple in you, and he wants to rebuild your spiritual life. But it is up to you to respond and to take action. If you guys want to talk about that some, if you want to pray about the fact that maybe you're discouraged, or that you've been putting God off, and it's time for you to stop delaying, or maybe you want to talk with um, any of us about what it looks like to take steps in that direction, or maybe your heart is heavy for someone that you know is not walking in restored relationship with God, Our staff will be in the back as well as a a group of your peers um, that are more than willing to pray with you guys. Um, But let's close in prayer as the worship team comes up. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word and that it is as applicable now as it was the day that it was written, the day that it happened, the day the prophet spoke it. God, I praise you for the lower story that is a beautiful story of um, the life of your people, but God, I am so thankful for the higher story one of you desiring restored relationship with us and that you go to all of the effort to make it happen. God, I ask that you would um, help us to be responsive in the areas where we need to repent, that we would repent, where we need to confess, that we would confess, and that we would stop making excuses, Um, but that we would do the work that you've called us to do, that we would walk in complete obedience. And Father, I specifically pray for those tonight that have been making excuses and just never submitted to you. They've never invited your spirit to dwell in them. They've never allowed themselves to become a temple for you, for God to be with us. God, I ask that you would make them uncomfortable, that you would make them willing to respond. God, that you would prime their hearts so that they would be responsive to you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.